Hello everyone, welcome to Star Psych, and today we're going to be talking about the idea of subtypes, or types that exist within certain personality types, and whether or not they do actually exist. And essentially, I just kind of want to give my opinion on whether or not there are subtypes within specific personality types. Let's get into it. So what do I mean by a subtype? Well, a subtype is essentially just the same personality type with some sort of variant in it that differentiates it from someone else of the same personality type. So for example, the system objective personality has 512 personality types, of which many hundred of them are sub variants of the 16 MBTI types. So for example, you could be an extroverted intuitive dominant who prefers their tertiary function over their secondary function, and therefore you are an NETE or NEFE extroverted intuitive dominant type. Now, I have some opinions on this type of subtyping system because a lot of systems, not just objective personality, use systems like this. And I am not a person, I'm not personally a fan of this type of system because I think that subtypes don't need to be strictly kind of codified into their own personality type if they're going to exist within the overall umbrella of another specific personality type. So to see what I mean here, let's first look at how Briggs evolved from Jung's model. So in psychological types, Jung proposes eight personality types, each one of these types essentially being one of the cognitive functions. So you could be an introverted intuitive type, which would be what we would call an INTJ or an INFJ, or an extrovert sensing type, an ESFP or an ESTP. And then he talked about the idea that the dominant function is always going to be supported by a specific auxiliary function. If you are a dominant rational type, so thinking or feeling, your secondary function would always be an irrational function. So one of the perceiving functions, intuition or sensing, or if you are a dominant irrational type perceiving, you would have a secondary judging function. So from this, we could make the natural next step or take the natural next step that Briggs did and say that, okay, so if it's going to be one of these functions, that means if you're an introverted intuitive dominant type, you could either have thinking or feeling as your auxiliary judging function. And therefore, each of these eight types is going to have a subtype or two subtypes associated with it that kind of come as natural evolutions. So you could be an NI type with auxiliary thinking or an NI type with auxiliary feeling. And this is what evolved into the MBTI 16 types. This is where interpretation gets a little bit tricky because Briggs took quite a few liberties when it comes to understanding and interpreting Jung's work. So we know from psychological types that the dominant function always exists in one specific cognitive attitude, so introversion or extroversion. And then we know that the repressed function exists in that function's opposite. So if you're an introverted dominant type, you're going to have an extroverted repressed function. What we don't know for certain is the attitude of the secondary or tertiary function because Jung never explicitly stated them. And that's why there's kind of a lot of confusion and debate over whether or not, say for example, the auxiliary or tertiary function are in the introverted or extroverted attitude, depending on what your dominant function is. Now Briggs took the liberty of interpreting his system to mean that there was going to be overall relative balance within the psyche. So if you're an introverted dominant type, you're going to have an auxiliary extroverted function, a tertiary introverted function, and a repressed extroverted function. This is the function stack that we know and use today in MBTI. While there is debate on whether or not this is actually how the functions portray themselves, essentially two functions being in each of the attitudes, I can see how Briggs came to this conclusion when you look at Jung's illustration of cognitive functions in the psyche in the book Psychology and Alchemy, the one that he proposed, and I'll bring that image up on screen here. You can see in this image that two functions exist within the conscious attitude and two exist within the unconscious attitude. Now, if we talked about the conscious attitude in terms of introversion and extroversion, we can then assume that therefore two functions must be in the introverted attitude if introversion is conscious and two must be in the extroverted attitude if extroversion is unconscious. Now this leaves up the question for debate on which order the functions go in, but generally we see the two center functions as kind of being even anyway. So I don't think the order in and of itself matters entirely that much as long as you understand the principle as to why Briggs interpreted the cognitive functions in this specific way. So you might be asking yourself, well, now you've told me the history of MBTI and how Briggs came to her conclusion, what does that have to do with subtypes? Well, the reason I told you that specific piece of information and those things is because now you can see how the Briggs system evolved from Young's and where her subtypes came from. Because the Briggs types are subtypes. They are not Young's original types, and therefore we refer to them as subtypes. They came as natural evolutions of Young's original types. 
Now, the difference in why we see these types as being kind of correct and why they make so much sense to us is because they allow for variance within them already. And my kind of point when we're talking about subtypes is I don't think we need subtypes that, again, codify these differences into strict personality types in and of themselves when the types already account for these differences within how we see them. To give an example of what I'm talking about, we can compare and contrast a little bit with objective personalities jumpers. So they have types that they believe use the first and third function primarily together and kind of ignore that secondary function. Now, if we look at the Briggs and Jungian interpretation, we could certainly see that yes, there is a possibility for a type that uses the third function because technically the third function is a second auxiliary as Jung referred to them. But the difference is that I would not codify this as a specific personality type in and of itself. I would not say that we have, say for example, an ENTP who is NEFE. I would still refer to them as an ENTP because they have these specific cognitive functions and the preference that they currently use them at within their life does not matter and does not change their specific personality type. And what I mean by that is that I think you can have people who are at points in their life where they prefer certain functions over the others, but that doesn't inherently change their personality type and they still have these overarching cognitive functions. And what I mean by that is, say, for example, we look again at the ENTP. If you look at my recent video where I analyzed Markiplier's personality type, it was the video before this one, you can see that I refer to him as likely being an ENTP with really healthily developed extroverted feeling to a point where I would almost call him an NEFE ENTP. The main difference though is that I would not refer to this as a codified type in and of itself and instead it would be kind of like a growth point somewhere along the journey of finding someone's type. It's not going to be the final resting point for your specific personality type. I know an ENTJ that I would refer to as TESE and I often say to him, man, you know, I think you'd be a little bit better off if you developed a little bit of that NI and started to kind of work on that a little bit. And the difference is that if I talk to him again 10 years from now, would he still be a TESE ENTJ? If his psyche balanced out between introversion and extroversion, would he still be a TESE ENTJ? And that's the kind of big difference there is do we need to have that difference because is there going to be variance across the lifespan that doesn't account for these specific things that are being measured when we look at subtypes? If we looked at subtypes through the lens of being developmental, then I think that's a perfectly healthy thing to assume. So essentially when you're looking at them through that specific lens, you would say that there's kind of an optimal version of most personality types. So when you think of like a really healthy INTJ, ESTJ, ESFJ, these sorts of things, we kind of can think of some person, someone comes to mind that kind of resonates with that archetype in our mind. Now, when we think about these specific subtypes of personalities, do they resonate with those healthy versions of personality types that we think about? Jung was a huge proponent of the idea of finding balance between the dominant attitude and the repressed attitude. So again, introversion and extroversion. And when we look at type two for our example, jumpers, or types who use their first and third function, we can see that there is no, there isn't balance in this area. And the question is, if they find that balance, does the type remain the same or does it change? Now there's other systems that use subtypes out there. I just am kind of talking about objective personality because they're the big one on the market these days. And I don't particularly personally agree with their classification of subtypes, but I don't think that it's inherently wrong to assume there is subtypes but I do think that subtypes tend to lead into an overall specific personality type and there's going to be variants within those subtypes, which is to say that yes, you could classify, say for example, ENFPs into 10 or 20 subtypes of ENFPs, but you would have to ask what is the kind of final destination for these ENFPs? Is there a healthier version of themselves that they can strive to reach towards? And is there going to be a way for them to balance their own psyche and come to terms with that? And then if they do, is their subtype the same or are they shifting to a different subtype within this specific system? And these are the kinds of questions that I think need to be asked if you're going to be working with a personality system that uses subtypes. How I work with people when it comes to typing and coaching is that I have the original 16 kind of MBTI types that represent all of the specific cognitive functions that a type would have. And I'm able to tell and work with someone who comes to me within that system because there's so much freedom to move around and understand that people are going to be at different developmental stages in their life. 
When I type an 18 year old who's barely even touched their auxiliary function, I have to treat their development as an entirely different thing than when I type or work with someone who's in their mid thirties to forties, who's probably at a point where they're either dealing with their tertiary function or maybe they're kind of coming to terms with certain stressors related to their repressed function, these sorts of things. And in my opinion, there's a huge difference between an 18 year old ENTP and a 25 year old ENTP and a 45 year old ENTP. And this is also going to be hugely dramatically different when you look at them in the placement of their culture and how healthily they were raised, what was their environment like. So in my opinion, it's not helpful or useful to apply subtypes to people because I can see their overall cognitive functions and help them work towards a more balanced version of themselves. The one that Jung kind of proposed with his idea where you would want to have the balance between these four functions and introversion and extroversion. And once I can help someone find that balance, we can balance out the psyche and they become more of a stable, and I don't wanna say optimized, but it really is kind of optimized version of themselves as a person. They're going to be stable, happy, healthy, because their conscious and unconscious attitudes aren't conflicting with each other, and there's not going to be this huge unbalance between them. All right, everybody, those are my opinions on subtypes and whether or not I think that they exist or are helpful or are useful. If you agree with me, that's good, but if you disagree, that's fine too, because I want you all to remember that these are just my opinions on the specific topic at hand, and I don't think that you should inherently just agree with me. If you disagree and you think that subtypes are useful, let me know down in the comment section below. Why are subtypes useful and helpful to you? Do you think that they are a meaningful distinction? I personally do not think that they are a meaningful distinction for the reasons listed in this video, but it's perfectly healthy and normal to have discussion and disagreements when you're talking about conceptual systems such as personality typology. So let me know your reasons down below if you do think that subtypes are going to be useful or helpful. Other than that, I would like to remind people that I do have personality typing sessions available at my website, asurasec.com. If you're interested in working with me to find out what your personality type is and what that means for you. This has been Asura from Asurasec. Have a good one.